guys, welcome back. We're about to dive right into calming signals. The term calming signals, this is a term that was coined by Turd Rugus, a seriously talented Norwegian dog trainer, and it certainly will change the way that you look at dogs for the rest of your life. So there are several functions of calming signals, communicating stress, relieving stress, communicating that you are not a threat, and also resolving conflict. So number one, we talk about calming signals. We always look at the context, the before, the during, and the after. These calming signals are also called displacement signals because they're normal dog behaviors that are actually displayed out of context. Okay, so for example, a dog might yawn, not because he's tired, but because another dog has gotten too close to his face. Always look at what else is happening around the dog, not just the behavior itself. Let's talk about some examples. So I just mentioned the example of a yawn. All right, so a yawn is a very common calming signal. Uh, My dogs use yawning quite a bit to communicate that they're feeling a little bit stressed. But yawning in in and of itself is a friendly or a stress signal. Um, A yawn can happen when a dog is uncomfortable, and it's usually the first signal that we see when a dog is feeling somewhat uneasy. The second example that I want to talk about in terms of being a common calming signal is sniffing the ground, yet another appeasement gesture, just meaning I am not a threat. Gaze aversion or looking away is an avoidance of direct eye contact with another dog or human. It's a polite and a very friendly gesture. It's generally seen in friendly, more neutral social groups. Um, When it's not accompanied by other stress signals, it is a signal of discomfort or avoidance. So the reality is when a dog looks away, it's done to kind of break the tension. So think about even you do the same thing in your own life with other human beings. Just look away in a moment of... Um, intensity or stress, it's a great way to kind of break that up and and create a new context for communication. Shaking off, that thing that dogs do when they're wet and trying to get their fur dry, but shaking off is something a dog does even when their fur is dry, right? So this is another non-threatening signal that's usually observed after another uncomfortable event. Barking is another common signal typically seen in a multi-dog environment. This is where a dog arcs its body away from an undesired object or a dog or a person. So when you think of arcing, if two dogs are coming head on, one dog will actually walk to the left or the right of the dog. So they're off center. So that's what arcing is. That usually happens when a dog is uncertain of something, a good way to get some distance. Remember, distance increasing behavior is a great way to create more safety. Other calming signals include lip licking or nose licking, just much like sniffing the ground, it's an appeasement gesture. Then we get into things like whale eye, also a calming signal, it's a way of appeasing or a way to display something, get get away from me please. Self-grooming, lifting the front paw, scratching, stretching, exhaling breath, freezing, rolling over, closing mouth and panting, all examples of calming signals, something that I want you to study on your own as well, both um, in your observation, but also with So what does inappropriate play look like? Starting with body language, you don't want to see the opposite of what we talked about in the last section. Stiff posture. If the dog is like this red dog here, very stiff, high tail, weight shifted forward, hard eyes and mouth. So if I saw these dogs in a play group, I might walk between them assuming I know these dogs, or I might make a noise or call them over. Likely the situation could escalate without a break. No reciprocation or breaks. Dogs that just won't stop playing need a break. The break may look like taking the dog out of a playgroup for five minutes or having the dog sit near you and petting them for a while. You can be creative with the breaks. Again, you'll hopefully start to see the dogs breaking themselves up. Ganging up. We see a lot of this at dog parks. There may be one dog chasing another dog, or one dog has something the others want, and it becomes a group of dogs targeting one. If you see a dog beeline for another dog or charge them, take the dog doing the charging out of the playgroup. If you have the ability to do a timeout, you may want to give these dogs a larger timeout. You don't want the dogs to have an opportunity to practice inappropriate behavior. The other piece is being too rough. Dogs that are roughhousing too much. If you feel like the arousal is getting too high, if you're starting to get stressed out, then go ahead and break those dogs up. Vocalizing and showing or using teeth are normal in dog play, but you'll have a sense of whether it's excessive or just too much. If you're not sure what to do, break it. Today we're going to talk about something that I think is widely misunderstood and also a really important concept to have discussions around if you are a dog professional a dog owner, and most importantly, a dog lover. That topic is aggression. We're going to go ahead and watch a video right now that is a compilation of several dogs this past summer 
um, on some of the beaches and dog parks around Chicago. As you're watching each of these dogs, I'd like you to keep in mind whether you consider any of these behaviors or all of them to be aggressive in nature. As you're looking at them, I want you to think about what the dog is going through and what the dog is perceiving in the moment. And I want you to look at body language and environment. And then we're going to discuss whether what you just saw, whether you consider things to be, some of those behaviors to be aggressive or not, whether you think it's normal. And the answer is that yes, actually, aggression is a very normal part of communication. In fact, all organisms will engage in aggressive behavior when the time is right. Uh, meaning that for dogs, the time is right under two circumstances in particular. There are several reasons that dogs can engage in aggressive behavior, but today we're going to talk about the two most common reasons that dogs will display aggression, especially as it relates to working with dogs in a professional setting. Um, but before we go any further, I want to make sure that we're really clear about the fact that aggression is very, very very normal, and although, um, again, widely misunderstood, it's still something that I want to help you understand from the dog's perspective. So aggression, again, in a professional setting commonly happens for two reasons. One, it is really a component of fear, and then secondly, it can be typically um, some competition for resources, and resources are any number of things that a dog may find or does find incredibly enticing, things like uh, it could be a dirty sock, it could be a human, a whole piece of property, or something as simple as a cotton ball on the floor. But rarely, very rarely, is it ever about rank or dominance. Very important because, again, that's one of the misconceptions around aggression is that when dogs do behave aggressively, it's all about rank and or dominance when the reality is statistically that's just not true. So let's define aggression. Here's this guy. Anyone want to give him a kiss? Uh, aggression is defined as one of three things, the threat, the intention, or the action of harm. It is that simple. One of those three key components need to be involved in order for it to meet the definition of aggression. So again, threat, intent, or action of harm. Let's go ahead and discuss fear first. We're going to talk about fear and resource guarding, but fear first. When there is fear, when the dog, when there's a present fear, you're going to see a several, one of several or maybe many of several different behaviors. And those behaviors range from running away or cowering, lowering the body, tucking tail. When you see this behavior, you're getting really good information from that dog that they want some distance from you. That flight is actually distance increasing on purpose to keep everyone safe. To that point, it's another good reminder to us that the dog decides what's scary, not us. It doesn't matter whether it's something the dog has seen a number of times throughout their life or whether it's a novel stimuli, it's still up to the dog. Fear is great uh, when there is a flight response, a little bit different when there's a fight response. So a fight response looks like this, direct stare, growling, teeth bearing, lunging, biting, all of the things that we consider uh, when we're thinking about the concept of aggression. We're going to go ahead and watch a couple of the videos now to show different elements or different examples of fearful behavior. This first video is a Bedlington Terrier engaging, uh, displaying some fearful behavior, not, so more of the flight side than the fight side. He's uh, looking around, hypervigilant, tucking tail, sitting behind his or her owner. Uh, good decision. Again, a lot of this comes down to uh, with fear is making a good decision. If you're a dog, uh, whether you're going to engage in a high risk behavior like fighting or a lower risk behavior like flighting or doing nothing as that dog was kind of doing a combination of. Let's look at the fear in this black dog on the ground. So he's trying to do nothing. All right. So not fight or fight, more of a freeze. And that didn't work for him. So at that point, then he stood up and, um, and engaged in some of the fight behavior. We saw a teeth bearing, a snap, a growl. And again, that is all fight behavior. Fear is also this. <laughs> So that's a great example of distance increasing behavior with some fighting as well. So there was some flighting going on. If you saw that German Shepherd kind of going behind the knees of the person on the left, but there was also some barking and some, and some more offensive behaviors, which again is a very, which is a sign of an incredibly conflicted dog and conflict has a lot to do with aggression 
We won't cover that in today's module around Aggression 101, but it's something I want to just put out there for you that we'll explore uh, later on in, in new Fetch Find modules and new badge offerings. So we've talked about fear. Now I want to talk about resources. And resource guarding is, again, something very common that a lot of dog professionals and dog owners have to deal with on a daily basis. And this is the idea that I have something and you know what? <laughs> I want to keep it. And importantly here is it's not about what you think is important or cool or useful or handy, but it's what the dog does, think, what the dog thinks is handy, useful, or cool. So that can be anything from a dirty sock to a cotton ball to a bone. It doesn't really matter. And, and sometimes, and these are the really hard cases when they're resource guarding human beings. We're going to talk though about food bowl because food bowl is a great place to have some kind of clinical, technical uh, approach to, uh, to resource guarding. Around a food bowl, what we'll see is um, typically freeze and stare, start eating really fast, growl, lunge, snap. But what I really think is important, an important takeaway here is if you see this behavior, we don't try to challenge it. We don't try to fix it in the moment. That requires a program for behavior modification, which again, we'll address another time. The other way that it the other way that we sometimes will see resource guarding is when a dog actually takes that rate, that prized resource and walks away into another room. That's a really clear example that that thing is important enough for a dog to leave the humans, to leave that environment of being around a human companion to go and enjoy that resource or quite honestly guard it. Here's some examples of some resources. Obviously there's that stake. That is really lovely and valuable to pretty much any dog I know. A rope toy, seemingly innocuous, but not to that puggle. And you all know this dog, right? <laughs> I think we've all met. We've all met that guy. The bone is just as big as him, but my goodness, it is his. Okay, so now that we've talked about resource guarding and we've talked about fear and we've talked about fear as it relates to aggression, what do you do now? Um, you know, you're, again, you're in the line of fire as a dog professional. You're helping, um, your job is to help keep these dogs safe and, of course, keep yourself safe. So if you do read aggressive behavior, again, a threat or intention, um, best thing to do is avoid direct eye contact. Now, just remember, some dogs will read direct eye contact as threatening. Now, at the same time, it's also really important that you don't turn your back. Now, that's really um, kind of a nuance there because you're going to want to take your eye contact away, but I'm, I'm, I'm basically putting out there that you don't turn your entire body around. You always want to keep your eyes even peripherally on the dog in front of you. And then lastly, move slowly and create some space between you and the dog that's displaying the aggression. Well, guys, that's Aggression 101. I'm Jamie Migdahl. Hell, you fetch finders. Go out there, keep yourself safe, keep your dog safe, and we'll see you next time. So let's talk about healthy and appropriate play, what we want to see in daycare play groups. Now, of course, you won't be able to break up every single thing because your eyes can't be on everyone constantly, but the important thing is to maintain a general, calm, relaxed environment. First, you want to see loose and curvy body language, meaning that they're giving other dogs space, they're wiggly and curvy, there's softness to their facial expression and movement, loose, swishy, neutral tail, not too stiff or rough. We recommend breaking things up if you see any stiffness. Frequent, ideally self-imposed breaks, separations, and pauses in the action. One great technique for helping to impose these breaks, if it's safe, is to walk between dogs that are kind of stiff or playing too rough, or even just staring at each other. You can also just call the dogs over to you. These are nice ways to help them learn to take a break without even having to touch them. What happens is the more breaks you give them, the more they learn to break up on their own, which makes everyone's job easier and safer. You set the tone. The calmer you are, the calmer they will be. Next, you want to see reciprocity. That means you want to see dogs taking turns, chasing each other, taking turns, pouncing on each other, being on top, larger dogs handicapping themselves with smaller dogs, sharing toys nicely, mouthing at each other, basically taking turns with each of the play behaviors you're seeing. The other piece is dogs being matched appropriately. Size is an easy way to structure play groups. Of course, you probably wouldn't match a Great Dane with a Chihuahua, but keep in mind that you may have a slow, low-energy Newfoundland and a high-energy Ridgeback in the same play group. 
Both are large dogs, but very different energy levels. This really depends on the dogs that you have. There can be some trial and error too. If a dog isn't doing well in one group, maybe try a different play group or do some one-on-one -on -one with that dog and then try to integrate them back into the group. When you know what appropriate play looks like, then you know who to pull out and put into different play groups. Hey there, and welcome to Body Language Basics on Fetch Find Online. In this lesson, we'll be talking about the main way in which dogs communicate, which is of course body language. So having some idea of what a dog is communicating makes for a much better relationship between us and dogs, one that's based on mutual understanding and respect. Now this lesson is designed to give you a very broad understanding of how dogs communicate. Of course, it's a very large field of study. There's lots to learn, so let's go ahead and get into the basics. There's a couple of tips I want you to keep in mind as we continue. Try to look at the whole dog, not just one part. Of course, it's important to break up behavior and look at each part of the dog, for example, eyes, tail, ears, but looking at the whole dog is going to give you a much clearer picture of how that dog is feeling right now. This one is really important. Be mindful to avoid putting your interpretation or judgment onto what you're seeing. It's very tempting to assign meaning to a behavior, but before you can really do that, you have to simply look at what the dog is doing rather than immediately deciding what the dog is feeling. We also often forget to treat dogs as dogs. They're definitely parts of our family. We love them. They're our best friends, but they're not little humans. And treating them as humans puts an enormous amount of pressure on them. They're never going to live up to those expectations. So we do a great disservice to dogs by treating them as people. So try to avoid anthropomorphizing them. Which leads me to try not to be a mind reader. First work on describing the behavior that you're seeing. Of course, we're never going to know exactly what our dogs are thinking. We can't get inside their heads. They can't tell us, but we can make some inferences. Dogs communicate in a variety of different ways. Number one is, of course, body language. Of course, dogs also communicate using vocalizations, barking, whining, howling, for example, but that's secondary. And the third way that dogs communicate is through scent. When a dog sniffs another dog, or let's say the debris left over from another dog, they're getting all kinds of important information about that dog. And likewise, they leave information about themselves through scent. Let's take a look at some dogs doing what they do best. Here's a very nice looking lab with some lip licks. I know that dog is expecting a treat. Here we have a dog marking using scent to communicate. We have some stress behaviors from this dog, a great looking yawn, some panting. We've got some play going on at the park. We have this dog looking around. Here's a dog sniffing, picking up all that information, possibly left by another dog, possibly just about the environment. So let's break this down a little bit more. Here we see a few dogs all doing somewhat different things. Body posture, how they distribute their weight, and how they move are all really important. This guy over here looks really stiff, his tail is held high, and his weight is forward. We tend to see this posture when a dog is on the offense, kind of ready to spring into action. This dog here has his weight shifted backward. What you're seeing here is commonly referred to as a play bow, and this dog certainly looks very playful, but it's more often just a pause in the action, so to speak. It's a great position from which to assess the situation and decide how to act. This little guy in the middle is purposefully putting himself off balance by raising that paw right there. This is often what we call a calming signal, which we'll talk about later in this lesson. Think about it this way. Being off balance puts the dog at a disadvantage. So this is often a sign that the dog means no harm in response to a potential threat. Now here we see hair on this dog's back standing straight up. We often call these hackles. A dog's raised hackles are related to how aroused the dog is, usually in response to a possible threat. Here's some general rules for understanding body posture in dogs. 
loose and curvy posture is a great indicator of a happy, friendly dog. In contrast, stiffness and stillness can signal fear or possibly aggression. Pay attention to where the dog is placing their weight. This is always important. Let's look at the tail. This is probably the most misunderstood element of canine communication. So let's look at some general tips. A wagging tail simply means arousal. Nothing more, nothing less. And when I say arousal, I mean how awake and ready to respond to the environment the dog is. And here's kind of a mind blower. A wagging tail doesn't always mean that the dog is happy. The position and speed of the tail is much more important than the fact that it's just moving. So let's start at the top. A very high and stiff tail, like we saw on that last slide, is related to very high arousal. There might be some movement, but be very cautious about a dog displaying this tail position. There's a good chance that that dog is on the offense. This tail position is a little lower than the first, but still fairly high. It might be a playful position, but we need to look at the rest of the dog to be sure about that. The sort of middle position is kind of your sweet spot. This is a more neutral position. The tail will ideally be wagging easily from side to side. This is likely the position that your dog's tail is going to be in when you get home and he's super happy to see you. This lowered position might be stiff or it might be loose depending on the situation and often signals some apprehension or appeasement behavior. If the tail is hanging loose, it might also just be a resting position. Again, we need a little bit more information. This tightly tucked tail usually isn't moving very much. This is a very clear sign of fear and is definitely a defensive position. This is definitely a dog that might need some space. So let's take a look at some tails. This guy has a high, wagging, looking to be playful tail, possibly searching for a treat. This guy has a T4 position tail. Is he just resting or is he a little stressed? That's the information we need and we get it when he goes behind that person and kind of hides out. These two, very different tail positions. One is a little bit more defensive, a little apprehensive. The other one, high, playful. They're not on the same page here, it seems. Make sure you're watching that black dog down there on the ground. That snap there, he is not happy with what's going on here, right? That tail is tucked out of some fear. That dog is getting a little bit too much in his face. We see this guy with kind of a higher flagged tail, little bit of a wag, not entirely sure. Let's move on. Let's take a look at how dogs communicate with their heads and faces. We'll start with the ears. In this first picture, the ears are pushed forward. Could be alertness, could be a possible precursor to some aggressive displays. The second photo shows ears to the side. This can be a little bit more of a neutral position. And the last one shows ears pushed back a bit. Ears moved backward can signal appeasement or fear, especially if they're very flat backward. The first picture of this boxer mix shows eyes that are a little bit hard and focused. Use caution when there's tension and focus in the eyes. The second shows the same dog looking up, presumably towards his person in class. The eyes are a little bit softer. And in the third, the dog is showing some whale eye where the whites of the eyes are showing. This is often a signal of stress. And of course, the mouth. The first photo shows a dog with a closed mouth. It may not seem like much, but when a dog goes from a relaxed pant to a closed, tense mouth, it may be significant. In contrast, a relaxed, open mouth, tongue hanging loosely, is usually a happy, friendly dog. But be careful because those lips pulled real back with some tension in there could also be stress. And the last photo is a big yawn. Of course, dogs yawn when they're tired, but they also use yawns to signal some stress or to calm themselves down, which brings us to our calming signals. 
So what exactly is a calming signal? These are normal behaviors that, when they're used out of context, can signal some stress. Remember the dog yawning on the previous slide? Yawning is, of course, a normal behavior, but yawning when a dog isn't tired or just waking up could mean that it's an intentional signal. So what's the purpose of these signals? These behaviors serve to diffuse conflict or resolve it, relieve stress, or they could just be behaviors the dog has learned feel good or get some sort of reward. So let's look at some examples. We've got shaking off, that's a big one. Whale eye, that showing the whites of the eyes. Stretching can also be a calming signal. Lip licking, yawning of course. Rolling over and exposing the belly turning their head away or turning their body away, giving you soft eyes, lifting a paw like we saw before, arcing, kind of turning their body and going around the thing that may be causing them stress, sneezing, yes, that is also one, and sniffing the ground. Of course, there are many more, but let's take a look at this video and see which ones you see here. So we've got a turning away, that dog has the ball, that other dog turned away a little bit. You see those hackles there, had another turn away. This dog is doing some lovely lip licking. You'll often see this in dogs that may be just a little bit stressed, maybe asking for a treat right here. <laughs> There's that play bow again, that can also be a calming signal. Here's a dog scratching, of course it may be itchy, um, but it could also be a calming signal if they don't actually have an itch. Here's some really good shaking off, relieving some of that tension, it's kind of like hitting a reset button. We've got some more lip licking there, some panting. These are all really beautiful behaviors and it's it's essential for a dog to be able to resolve conflict peacefully. When it comes down to it, our dogs are highly social animals, and they've developed a lot of complicated behaviors to communicate with each other.